Okay, let's get going. Hello and welcome to the sixth and final press briefing at the 238th meeting of the American Astronomical Society. I'm AAS Press Officer Rick Feinberg, and I'm assisted today by the editor of AAS Nova, Susanna Kohler, and the AAS Media Fellow, Farini Conchati. The, uh, there's at least two press releases going out this afternoon, um, and there may be more. So uh, check out the online press kit for links to those, and we'll also put them in the Slack channel as we find them. Uh, the Slack channel, by the way, is, if you haven't added it yet, is uh, hashtag press underscore conferences. And the Slack channel is for informal chat. The uh, Q&A will be handled through the Q&A button that is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can type your questions into the Q&A. And if you see a question that you like and that you really want to see answered or that you are going to ask yourself, you can uh, upvote it and that'll raise it in the queue. And we'll do all the questions at the end after each of the presentations. Just want to let everybody know we are recording this and streaming it live to YouTube and we'll have an archived video available for, uh, linked from the online press kit after the briefing. Uh, the way press conferences work at the AAS, in case this is your first one, is that uh, after I introduce everybody and introduce the topic, we'll turn it over to the speakers one right after the other, and we'll do the Q&A after the last presentation. When you do enter a, a question into the Q&A box, please try to remember to indicate, uh, I think your name will show up automatically, but please indicate your affiliation and indicate who your question is directed to. Since we're doing all the questions at once and since they're all on exoplanets, it might not be immediately obvious uh, who your question is directed at if you don't specify that. Um, just so you know, the Q&A box is, uh, because we're holding the Q&A till the end, um, even though the presenters could answer the questions by typing answers into the Q&A, they're not gonna do that. We're gonna wait uh, to read the questions aloud at the end. That's something that Susanna will do. Um, and the purpose of that is to make sure that the folks who are watching on YouTube, and we do seem to have quite a few watching on YouTube rather than participating by Zoom, uh, they'll be able to hear the questions because they can't see the Q&A box since they're not within Zoom. All right, so far uh, I have managed to keep up pretty well with the briefings. I think uh, all five videos of the earlier briefings are linked from the press kit and on the AAS Press Office YouTube channel. Um, and all the press releases that I'm aware of are linked from there. And I have uh, copies of the presentation slides for almost everybody, I think, maybe even everybody. Uh, so we're keeping up with that pretty well. All right, I think that's everything that I wanted to say. Uh, so as has become standard at AAS meetings, the topic that seems to need the most press conferences is exoplanets uh, and their close cousins brown dwarfs and that's certainly proved to be the case again this time uh, where we've had a briefing and a half uh, this being the full briefing and the other half having occurred earlier today so it's a very hot topic and as you can see um, it's dominated by younger researchers which is great because we uh, you know our field is is becoming very uh, very dynamic and, and exciting with all the young people coming into the field and, and especially because so many of them are going into uh, exoplanet science, which is really hitting its stride now. So today we're gonna have four presentations and they'll be in the following order. The first will be gone but not forgotten, 372 new planets discovered in Kepler K2 data. And that'll be given by John Zink of the University of California at Los Angeles, UCLA. He'll be followed by Saki Bure from the Florida Institute of Technology, picking up on the same theme, scaling K2, validation of Kepler K2 planet candidates using Vespa. And I don't think she's referring to a scooter. Next, we'll have revealing the vertical cloud structure of a Beta Pictoris B analog. That's by Elena Manjavakis from the Space Telescope Science Institute. 
And last but not least, how two old unrelated exoplanet systems turned out to be 400 million year old siblings. That'll be given by Jason Curtis of Columbia University. All right, so with that, we're all gonna turn off our video except for John and we're gonna let John take it away from here. Hi everyone, uh, I'm John Zink from the University of California, Los Angeles. And today I wanna to talk about a bunch of new planets that we've recently found. So why do we care about finding new planets? We have you know, some thousand, couple thousand exoplanets we've found thus far. Why do we wanna find more? And really the big question we wanna answer with all these exoplanets is we wanna understand how unique our solar system is. And to do so, we need to understand how planets form and how their orbits evolve over time. So the more planets we have, the better we have a larger test bed we have for understanding these formation mechanisms. So one of the keystone missions for exoplanet demographics was the Kepler mission that stared at one patch of the sky for four years. Of these transiting events where a planet would move in front of its host star. By doing so, we infer information about the period and the radius of this planet. Kepler was really a great mission. It identified uh, about 3,000 exoplanets. And you know, shown here in this plot is just a, a scattering of all those planets discovered as a function of period and planetary radius. I've also plotted the solar system planets on here just for reference. So something you'll notice is that most of the planets discovered uh, were a little bit larger than Earth. So those are known as the super Earth planets and a little bit smaller than Neptune. So those are the sub Neptunes. So that's really the focus of a lot of the exoplanet demographics I'm gonna talk about today. Super, uh, super Earths and sub Neptunes. So after the Kepler mission, there was a malfunction that caused the spacecraft's pointing to no longer be able to focus on that one patch of the sky. And it began looking at different regions of the galaxy. And by doing so, it really enabled us to probe different aspects of galactic latitude, stellar age, stellar masses, and stellar metallicity. And these are all potentially unique features that may inform us about planet formation and evolution. However, the problem with the, K the K2 mission is that it wasn't really easy to fully automate this process of searching for these transiting planets. And because there were these strange dips that occurred due to the malfunction on the spacecraft, most of the discoveries from K2 had come through uh, visual inspections. People had to actually go through each one of these data sets and identify if this was a meaningful dip or not. Doing so was very fruitful, and there was about 889 planet candidates identified for K2 through this human vetting process. Now, the Scaling K2 mission, our goal was to fully automate this process. And in doing so, I developed a code known as Eddie Vetter, uh, which was you know, inspired by the Pearl Jam lead singer. And our goal here is to fully automate this process. So not only can we do it faster, we can also do it more thoroughly and have a better understanding of what the inherent biases are in our planet sample. So one of the really exciting things that came out of this that I'm just so pumped about is the number of new planet candidates we found. So we found 372 new planet candidates. So in this data set that has been kind of sitting around for a couple of years now, there's just been 372 planet candidates just waiting to be discovered. And so as you can see in this pie chart here, this is a rather large addition to the existing population of K2 planets. So this is a, a really exciting time to be in the exoplanet demographic game. Uh, within that sample, we also found 18 multi-planet samples. So I'm gonna save talking about any specific systems for Saki Bure, who's gonna talk after me, but there's a lot of really exciting science coming out of here. So just to briefly discuss a few of our early findings, um, I wanna talk about the overall statistics or number of planets per star when we think about super Earths and sub-Neptunes. So 
the Kepler field found about 1.25 roughly uh, planets per star. This bar indicates the, the width or the uncertainty in this value. And you'll notice on this plot on the left-hand side, I'm actually showing the metallicity. And what this is, is the, um, the iron content in the stellar sample. So all the stars in the Kepler field have some amount of iron content in them. And this is just showing a histogram of that distribution uh, for the population. So when we looked at a small part of our K2 sample, what we noticed is that two things. Uh, the amount of iron is actually lower. So this is a iron poor or a metal poor uh, population of stars. And we also found a slightly lower occurrence value. And there's two potential conclusions that you can make from looking at this chart. Number one, that metallicity is important for the uh, creation and formation of these super Earth and sub Neptune planets. And so this iron poor region doesn't have quite as many planets per star. But you'll also notice that there is a minor overlap between these two bars. So once we uh, go through our larger sample that we now have, we might find that these differences are not quite meaningful and the Kepler sample was rather representative of the local galaxy as it stands. So overall demographics. So there are two features identified by Kepler. Uh, one of them being the sub-Neptune desert. So, sorry, just to go through this plot, this is planet radius on the y-axis and stellar light intensity. So the amount of sunlight or the amount of starlight each one of these planets is receiving from its host star uh, comparative to the Earth. And when you plot this for Kepler, there's this interesting gap over here where there's not a lot of planets. And there's also an interesting gap here. Now, we think that this might be indicative of some formation mechanism. And we really want to probe this, these regions further with a larger sample of planets. So is there some kind of mechanism causing it to you know, evaporate these envelopes and create these um, core, remaining cores? That's potentially one solution to this. But it's hard to probe these without a larger sample. And so this is the Kepler map. I want to show you what the K2 map looks like. So you notice it looks very, very similar. We, we find there's both a sub-Neptune desert and a seeming valley over here. And this is really interesting because it's indicative that these are true uh, demographic features that are not unique to just the Kepler data set. But you'll also notice that they kind of morph a little bit. And that is really important because it may be indicative that once we go through the, the stellar samples and kind of separate this into smaller mass and larger mass stars, there might be some more complexity in here that we can really probe and kind of figure out what are the important features of exoplanet formation. So in conclusion, uh, in my talk today, I talked about 372 brand new planet candidates that we found in the K2 data that have just been sitting there waiting to be discovered. Uh, I also talked about some minor occurrence differences we're finding with the K2 sample when compared to the Kepler field. And finally, we showed that the Neptune desert and the radius valley can both be identified in the K2 sample. And it's really going to enable us to probe these uh, demographic features to potentially back out what the true origin of planet formation is. I will, at this point, I will thank you and uh, move on to the next speaker. Thank you, John. Um, just Okay, so hello everyone. I'm Sakhi Bure. I graduated from Florida Institute of Technology and I'm currently working at the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research in Pune, India. I am also working with Dr. Jesse Christensen and John and the rest of the Scaling K2 team on the Scaling K2 project in which I'm validating K2 candidates uh, more specifically candidates that John's pipeline has discovered um, using VESPA. So just to sum up like a quick, up, uh, because John has done a really good job explaining Kepler and K2, uh, because the K2 mission could observe different parts of the sky, it, uh, even though it was restricted to the plane of the solar system, it could look at different latitudes of the galaxy. And so it observed a lot of variety in the types of stars. 
And so we could look at a lot of different types of planets around different types of stars, and that makes for great demographic studies. So what, uh, why I am also using the word validated is because uh, when we ass uh, assign a candidate to be a confirmed planet, it's because we have been able to measure its mass. And when we uh, don't get to use those follow-up measurements all the time because of uh, stars being faint or there just being too many to be able to quickly follow up with mass measurements, we use a tool, a statistical validation tool because that works best in such cases. And that looks at how likely is the event observed uh, to be a transit caused by a planet. So uh, the tool that I am using is taking all of these uh, candidates, so the 372 new candidates and the some of the older ones totaling to the 758 candidates detected by John's pipeline and passing it through a module called VESPA, which is a, a tool called VESPA, which is a Python package developed by Dr. Timothy Martin. And the gist of what VESPA does is it compares the shape of the transit, uh, shape of the event observed and determines how likely it is to be a planetary transit. So the plot on the left uh, shows a candidate that was not validated because the probabilities of other events, which look like a transit, but aren't really a transit uh, were higher. And that doesn't mean that it's not a planet. It just means that we cannot be very confident that it is a planet. And as you can see the plot on the right, the confidence level that we want is 99% likelihood of the transit being caused by a planet. So after running all of these tests and some additional constraints or uh, confirmations to make sure that the event we're observing is happening on the target star. We got 21 new statistically validated planets so far. We still haven't finished going through the whole catalog. Um, and they are plotted here on this plot uh, in the larger dots where the colors correspond to, where the colors correspond to, I'm sorry, uh, are my slides progressing? They just jumped around a little bit. Uh, so you're currently okay. on the not validated versus validated. Okay, so now I'm on the next plot. Yes, which statistically shows, valid. Uh, yes, okay, thank you. Uh, so we have these uh, validated planets, uh, which I have plotted here in the larger dots and the colors correspond to the actual visual uh, colors, which was a code that was developed by Hari and Heller and I'm going to now talk about some of these systems and planets. So the first two that I'm going to highlight are uh, orbiting some of the brightest stars among these 21. And uh, what bright stars, this is an example, this is not like the planet or the candidate that we have validated, uh, but what bright uh, stars enable us to do is look at the atmosphere of the planet transiting in front of it, and that helps us determine the composition of the planet. So these two that I had highlighted on the previous plot are about 1.7 Earth radii. So I don't know, but the Earth is like really a really small dot next to the 1.7, and uh, all of these are to scale, but the planets and the stars are not to scale with respect to each other because uh, they would not fit in the slides. Um, so these are uh, between the sizes of Earth and Neptune. And they're uh, like you can see, the stars are really bright and they get a lot of solar radiation uh, compared to what we get on the Earth. And the next system that I'm going to talk about is a multi-planet system that we have found. So uh, John talked about us detecting 18 new multi-planet systems. So we already validated one of those. And it's really interesting because it has two planets that are roughly the same size. So again, I have an example of an artist, artist depiction of mini Neptunes, um, but like to give you a rough uh, fact sheet of the two, they are about three times the Earth's radius and uh, about, yeah, uh, they orbit their star very, very fast. And um, they get a lot more 
solar radiation than even the previous two candidates around the bright star because they're so close to their star. Um, the last two that I'm going to talk about are on the edge of what uh, the Neptune desert that John described. These are extremely rare objects because we don't find a lot of those and we are still figuring out, figuring out how or uh, what causes them to be so rare. Is it a formation mechanism or is it something about their structure that uh, is just unstable? So these are, one of them is really large. It's about six Earth radii and uh, it orbits its star in five days then they both receive a lot of um, radiation from their stars uh, compared to our uh, compared to what we get on the earth and it's just a really good uh, candidate for follow up studies especially to get uh, mass measurements and figure out their densities and thus try to get a clue for their composition and so uh, to sum up we are trying to validate candidates detected in the first fully uniform search uh, in the entire K2 catalog. Uh, so far, we have 21 new statistically validated planets, and there are more that are in the process of being validated. And what also makes this really cool is that even though the telescope is not in operation anymore, we still have a lot more science that we can do and a lot more planets that we can keep discovering and learning more about uh, with these. And with that, I end my talk. Uh, and I, the next speaker is Elena. Thank you. Thank you, Saki. I'm gonna share my screen here. Mm -hmm. All right, I hope you are seeing my slides. We are. Right. All right. So today, what I'm going to talk about is about how we are revealing the vertical cloud structure of exoplanet analogs. So we have been talking a little bit now about giant exoplanets. Uh, and probably one of the aims we have for giant exoplanets in this decade is to determine how the cloud structure of these objects looks like. Um, do they look like Neptune and the other giant planets we have in the solar system? or not. Unfortunately, due to some technical limitations that we have, uh, it's so far still tough to get uh, data with enough precision to know how the vertical uh, structure and the structure in general of this object is. But there are good news, and is that giant exoplanets have analogs that are called brown doors. Brown doors are also substellar objects, and many of them have similar uh, effective temperatures, similar gravities, and similar masses to some giant exoplanets uh, with the advantage that brown dwarfs are usually isolated. They are not orbiting any star, so they are technically much easier to observe. So we can use brown dwarfs as proxies to try to understand how the atmospheres of, this, of giant exoplanets look like. And I'm going to explain how this works. So we all know this beautiful uh, cave of Jupiter in which we can see the bright bands and, and uh, dark bands, the spots of Jupiter. Uh, and just naturally Jupiter, we can we know that the bright structures in Jupiter produce actually maximum in the light curve, uh, in the photometric light curve of Jupiter. And we know that the minimums uh, create, uh, basically the minimums are created by spots, the dark spots, the dark bands. So knowing this information, we can do reverse engineering, and given any like any liker of a brown board, uh, we can actually guess which structures are present in the atmosphere of this object. So this is great because uh, only with photometry we can have so much information. But it would be even better if we had the spectroscopy because spectroscopy means that we are covering a wider wavelength of, uh, range of wavelengths. And that allows us to look deep into the atmosphere of, of brown dwarfs and uh, that are yeah, and exoplanet analogs. So, so far we have been using a lot of HST, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope to do this kind of studies. But actually uh, doing these studies from the ground is also possible. If you have something like most fire at the WMK Keck Observatory, uh, most fire is a multi-orbit spectrograph. 
in the near infrared. Uh, and MOSFET fire allows us to take a simultaneous spectrum of our target and calibration stars. So we can monitor our target and the same calibration stars all the time. And using this spectrum of the calibration stars, we can remove the contamination introduced by the Earth's atmosphere. That, of course, we don't have with Hubble because Hubble is orbiting Earth, but we have from the ground. And this was one of the major problems uh, why we couldn't uh, do this uh, this kind of projects from Earth is because we, there was no such a way of eliminating the contamination of the atmosphere and also uh, of eliminating the spurious variability introduced uh, by the Earth's atmosphere. So if we have something like most fire, we can eliminate this spurious uh, variability from the uh, atmosphere of the Earth and actually get the intrinsic variability of our brand work. This is the first time Something like this, such a project by spectrophotometric variability has been done uh, with MOS fire. So since it was the first time we used MOS fire for this purpose, we took uh, a very easy target to do, a very bright brown dwarf that is 2 mass 2208 plus 2921. Uh, but it's also very interesting because it's an analog to the Beta Pictoris B exoplanet. It's an analog because it has the same temperature, same age. Uh, and very similar mass to a Jupiter massive. Uh, but in addition, we knew that this brown dwarf is variable and it has a rotational period of 3.5 hours. So these are the 13 spectra that we took in total in the J-band using most fire across 2.5 hours of, of uh, monitoring. Most fire has a fairly high resolution so we could resolve the alkaline lines that are marked here. And basically, something very important that we wanted to study is uh, how the variability in these alkaline lines compares with the variability in the overall j band Because these alkaline lines give us information about different clouds, uh, about different pressure levels, about different heights in the atmosphere of the object than in the j band and does it make sense that we find variability higher variability amplitude in the alkaline lines and uh, than in the J band? Well, so for that, we had to first uh, ask a relative transfer model how is the vertical structure? And given the vertical structure, if it makes sense, uh, what we are finding with most fire. So the vertical is also of this object uh, using just uh, the temperature and the gravity for these brown dwarfs is like this. So it has mostly three main layers of clouds, all of them silicate clouds and aluminum oxide clouds. These are the, the depths at which each of these layers of clouds is uh, situated. And we need to take into account that when we observe with uh, most fire, the alkaline line is just observing the top layer of these clouds. The sodium line is observing the, the upper two layers of clouds, and the J band is observing all the three layers of clouds all merged together. So how now to know if the if what we found with most fire in terms of variability makes sense or no? We created simulated maps of this object. These are toy maps, pretty simplistic. That doesn't really need to represent the real map that we have for this object. But what is for sure true is that uh, if we only observe the potassium line. We're going to look at a map that is the higher atmosphere map. With the sodium, we are going to be able to see a little bit deeper. We will be able to, be able to see a little bit more uh, atmospheric characteristics. And in the J-band, we are going to see all the three layers of clouds together. So if for each of these maps that I show you, we create a light curve as we were doing with Jupiter, uh, we can also measure the variability amplitude of this light curve and the variability basically. And actually, the models confirm that what we found with most fire makes sense. So the variability amplitude detected also in the models uh, in the alkaline lines is higher than for the overall j band So this is great because it's exactly what we find with most fire, that the variability in the alkaline lines is higher. So this is great. This is great news. So we can be pretty confident that the cloud layers of this uh, brown dwarfs analog to the Beta Pictoris B exoplanet is pretty much something like this. 
And I'm looking forward to do this in other broad words that have also are also analogs to the annexo planets to know more about these objects. So finally, I would like to conclude with acknowledgments to my collaborators and to the Keke staff observatory and the PIKE team. So thank you very much. And I will hand over to the next speaker now. Hi, I am Jason Curtis. I'm an associate research scientist at Columbia University, and I work with a team of high school students at the American Museum of Natural History in the Science Research Mentoring Program. Today, I'm going to tell you the story of how two old and unrelated exoplanet systems, Kepler-52 and Kepler-968, turned out to be 400 million year old siblings. You can see the stars here between the Cygnus and Draco constellations near the Summer Triangle. The stars were observed by Kepler to each host three transiting exoplanets, all about twice the size of Earth, all orbiting their stars between four and 36 days, much more quickly than Mercury. The stars themselves are cage dwarfs. They have masses between 60 and 70% of the suns. They're a lot dimmer. We wanna use planets like these to study how planet properties evolve over time, particularly over the first billion years. To do this, we need precise ages. The trouble is that these cage dwarfs evolve very gradually over time. The luminosity, for example, changes very, very subtly over billions of years compared to, say, for the sun. And this leaves their ages essentially unconstrained using traditional techniques. The latest calculations using Gaia data place them somewhere between 3 and 16 billion years, which is essentially the entire history of the universe. And this problem with ages affects 20%, maybe even up to half of the exoplanets discovered by Kepler. And the problem is it's exacerbated for younger stars, those that are less than a billion years old, the ones that we think should show how the, the say for example, uh, the planet sizes go from formation to their final configurations. So what can we do? Well, in my opinion, the best way of precisely age dating young stars and their planets is by associating them with their birth clusters. As it turns out, Kepler-52 uh, Kepler and Kepler-968 are members of an alleged grouping of stars known as Theia 520. As the name implies, the, there are many more of these Theia objects, which are discovered by our collaborators, Marina Kunkel and Kevin Covey in the Gaia dataset. But Theia 520 is special because it has these known, already known exoplanet, multi-planet systems. The observational Hertzsprung-Russell diagram at the right suggests that these are stars that are truly related because it is, uh, shows a tight main sequence. The trouble is that there are very few high mass stars in the upper left, which are those that reveal the age of a population. So with uh, isochrone dating, it might be between 100, 500 million years, hard to say. So we appeal to gyrochronology, the process of telling time with spinning stars. If you take a group of stars that were all born together, like those in the Pleiades cluster, and you plot their masses versus how fast they spin, the stars organize themselves into sequences. The Pleiades has a slow sequence and a rapid sequence. And over time, those sequences merge together and tighten and evolve vertically through this distribution, through this diagram. So if the stars in Theia 520 were truly born together, their rotational distributions should be similarly tight. So the remarkable fact about Theia 520 is that a portion, the southern portion, was observed by Kepler for nearly four years. And the northern portion actually falls in the TESS northern cont continuous viewing zone. TESS normally observes portions of the sky for 27 days, every 30 minutes, but due to its tiling strategy, there are certain overlap regions. And so the, the northern portion of the cluster shown in red actually have one year of TESS data. In addition to these two space missions, there's this wiki transient facility in California, which collects nightly images of the observable sky since March of 2018. And you can see it right, examples of the light curves for Kepler-968, a single test sector, 27 days long, but collected every 30 minutes. A more coarse light curve from ZTF, but with a much longer observing season. And the Kepler data are simply unparalleled. Unfortun and this is only 8% of the available Kepler data for this star. Unfortunately, only 10 members were observed by Kepler, 
but we can successfully recover the same rotation period from each of these facilities. So when we combine them together, we can complete a more thorough rotational census of this or any population. And what we find is that we have 130 stars with measured rotation periods from these facilities. The stars indeed follow a tight sequence, which proves that they're the same age. And Kepler-52 and 968 sit on top of this sequence, which supports their membership in this cluster. When we compare this rotational sequence to those for other benchmark clusters that are much more better characterized, like the Pleiades, Praesepi, and so on, we can determine that based on the rotational data that Theia 520 appears to be 350 million years old. So rotation says 350, the Hertz von Russell diagram, 430, so about 400 million years for this group. That means we can add these six planets to the small but growing list of young cluster planets. There are 29 or so published so far, they just less than a billion years. And so adding six might seem small, but it's actually a big increase for this small sample. Unfortunately, it's still too small to really witness how planets like their sizes evolve and change over time. We need a much bigger sample to do that. But I'm hopeful that we can actually grow this sample dramatically in the coming years because all the data available, all the data required for this study were already available freely online. That includes the Gaia astrometry to find these clusters, the light curve data from NASA's Kepler and TESS and the NSF funded ZTF to measure the rotation periods and spectroscopy I didn't mention from Keck, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey's Apogee program and the Chinese Academy of Sciences LAMOS telescope. So there are thousands of newly identified clusters in the galaxy found in Gaia, more awaiting to be discovered. Some of these already have known planets as members, and there's going to be many more planets found by tests in the coming years. So with these techniques that we're developing and others, we hope to grow the sample so we can witness the process of planet evolution over the first billion years. So to summarize, Theia 520 is a new group of stars. It's about 400 members. Stars are about 1,200 light years from Earth. It's actually really nearby for astronomical standards. And based on the rotation periods and the Hertz von Russell diagram, it's clear that these stars are born together 400 million years ago. We now have six newly age dated young planets that we can add to the small but growing list of cluster planets. And there are many more waiting to be found and characterized. Thanks. All right, thank you all very much. We will go to the question and answer period now. I uh, see that we do have a couple queued up. Susanna, I'll turn it over to you. We have one queued up so far. So for everybody listening, please, please send us your questions in the question and answer box at the bottom. Uh, the first question that we have is for John Zink. This comes from Lawrence Grow of the Sky and Telescope. She's the intern there this summer. And she asks, in your plots of planet size versus stellar light intensity, in addition to the desert and valley, there also appears to be regions of density. Out of curiosity, what causes this preferential planet formation? Could whatever is causing this density give clues as to the causes for the desert and valley? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, so if we think back about that plot, there was a really large density of sub-Neptunes. And one thing to remember is that these plots don't necessarily account for sample completeness. So one thing that's really important and one of the main reasons we want to do this full automation uh, for our pipeline is we want to understand what are the inherent biases in our sample. And so while it looks like there's this enormous amount of sub-Neptunes in this like one little patch, uh, we have to remember that this sample is biased by our ability to detect planets si of uh, larger sizes. So the smaller uh, group, which is the super Earths, uh, which doesn't seem quite as dense, uh, is actually much harder to detect. So while they look like there's a, some definition in the density of those two uh, regions, it's actually quite inverted in reality when we account for those uh, un inherent biases. So there's actually a lot more super Earths than there are 
sub Neptunes, or you know, it, it's it's at least a little bit closer. So it doesn't seem like there's quite a big difference there. Um, but yeah, these these weird formation mechanisms are definitely not completeness issues because we wouldn't expect it to suddenly you know drop and then come back up. It should just kind of continuously drop downward. And so it's really interesting to understand what these formation mechanisms are. Um, some of the leading theories on it is we think that planets are distributed relatively even across these ranges and nature uh, kind of evaporates off the envelope of these planets in this radius valley because they don't have quite enough gravity to hang on to their outer envelope, pushing them down into the super earth regime. So that's one of the potential theories that could kind of give us some insight on what's happening here. Thank you. Uh, the next question we've got is coming from Ethan Siegel of Forbes, starts with a bang. Uh, this is a question for Jason Curtis. You mentioned that the tight sequence in rotation versus mass proves that these stars are the same age. Is this tight correlation purely empirical or is there a physical mechanism that we understand that's underlying it? Could this rotation mass correlation between just two identified stars be a spurious artifact of the data? Uh, great question. All right. The first thing you need are accurate rotation periods. So one of the spurious issues in data can be a sampling alias. So ZTF records data every night. And so measuring rapid rotation signals can be confused with longer signals. But we have TESS and Kepler, and all together, we can be confident that we're measuring the true rotational uh, periods for these stars. Now, why are the sequences tight? Stars are born rotating the range of rates from a few hours to a few days to 10 days. And so there's this whole ooh, uh, range of periods. And over time, the stars spin down due to their magnetic fields. The magnetic fields are generated and powered by their rotation. And their fields interact with their solar winds and cause them to lose angular momentum and slow down over time. The point is that the faster stars slow down more quickly than the slower stars in a convergent way so that after 100 million years, the initial spread converges to a tight sequence. And then that tight sequence can then evolve to more slower periods over time. So there's a physical understanding for why this happens and it is an empirical discovery. So surveying every single cluster or older than 100 million years has this defining feature of a mass versus rotation period tight sequence. There can be outliers and there can be a, a rapid sequence in the early years that can converges, but, but th there are at any given age, there's a unique basic signature of the, what the distribution should look like. So we had a, another question on the same topic that came from Richard Lovett. Um, and I think you've just addressed all the components of it. The only element that maybe you didn't was, he asks, how quickly does this do stars change in where they sit in this, uh, this relation? Well, in uh, 1972, Andrew Skumanich published a relationship that said that the rotation period evolves as a square root of age. But things are more complicated than that. So the best way to know how the stars spin down is by observing their rotation periods in a variety of different clusters at different ages. And so we, the, uh, it's complicated. There are periods where the stars seem to be spinning down quite quickly, and then they kind of stop for a while and hang out, they temporarily stall, and then they spin down some more. And, and so it's, it's, it's a complicated pattern, and there's not a great model that describes it. It's been produced yet, because each time we have a new cluster added, it kind of changes the picture. But what we did was we compared the rotational distribution of Theia 520, the planet hosting cluster, to all the other clusters that have this kind of data sets. And so what we were able to do is relatively rank all the clusters from young to old. And then we compared the ages from the isochrone fitting, this, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams for those that had that. And that's how we were able to really pin down the age for this cluster. And so we can tell the difference that 350 million years versus 100 million years versus five, it's very clearly different. So a 50 million year error bar is probably reasonable. Great, thanks. 
Uh, the next question is for John. This comes from Joan Nahita or Nachita, I don't know, uh, from Noir Lab. Do you expect the incidence rate of small planets to depend on stellar metallicity? Why or why not? Yes, uh, it's, it's kind of unclear. So we expect stellar metallicity. It tells us something about the disk that the planet's formed in. And we think if there's more metals in the disk, we have a greater chance of you know, forming, the, coagulating these planets and starting to form some kind of planetesimal. And that has been seen, there has been a link that has been observationally seen for the gas giants. So stars that have a higher metallicity, we're finding more gas giants around those types of stars. Um, however, this is not, it's, it's not clear that the same effect drags down into the super Earth and sub Neptune regime. In fact, uh, a lot of the Kepler data kind of indicated that it kind of flattens out. And so metallicity didn't play a major factor in the formation of super Earth and sub Neptunes. However, uh, one thing to remember with the Kepler samples, it has a very narrow focus of stellar metallicity. So it's not able to really probe the, the outer wings of stellar metallicity. And so with the K2 sample, we're hoping that we can kind of break down that selection effect and look at these different regions of stellar metallicity and see if there is a large difference in planet occurrence for these super Earths and sub Neptunes as a function of metallicity. Um, our early findings seems to indicate that there may be some link there. So we're definitely, we're, we're excited about that and we're gonna be probing that with more detail um, in the near future. And Joan also has a question for Elena. Uh, do your results say anything about the sizes of clouds as a function of height in the atmosphere? Right, uh, indeed. Um, so we have the models that I mentioned during my talk, and those uh, actually give us the concentration of the different cloud species uh, in height, right? So all the, the Let's say that the picture is a little bit simplistic, what I show in the presentation. In reality, uh, the cloud condensate at a level of height that I that's, that's right in the picture, but then it starts disappearing little by little as you go up. So those are given also by the model. So we have uh, an idea of how is the, the concentration of a different cloud species uh, across all, all the height. Indeed, yes. Great, thanks. Uh, Larry Krummenecker from the Galactic Times has a question for Jason. Uh, how far away and how bright are these stars? The average distance is 1200 light years. But this is not a typical star cluster that's really dense and spherical and all the stars are basically at the same place. It's actually quite elongated. The um, uh, kind of, I think, facing kind of towards the sun, there's an elongation of something like 300 light years. So it's 1200 light years away, but it's also kind of really spread out. It seems there's a dense core, and then there's these long tidal tails coming out of it, hundreds of light years in either direction. The stars themselves are bright for telescopes, but are not something you could see with like binoculars or the, definitely not the unaided eye. This is definitely not the kind of star cluster you can you would you know use your own telescope and look at a stargaze with. It's a you know really diffuse and and, and sprawling across the sky. And we've got another question for you coming from Richard Lovett of Cosmos. Uh, what will we learn about the evolution of planetary systems as this data set grows? So John was talking about some of these um, planetary properties that change over time, things like the planet sizes. There's this radius valley that's been identified, separating these different categories, the sub-Neptunes and super-Earths. And there's some evidence that planets that are really young, younger than 50 million years, are much bigger than the older planets. And so there seems to be some evolution going on in their sizes. This could be due to, you know, the energy that's like, you know, locked inside their cores from their formation that's, you know, coming out and, and, and just kind of dissipating their, their atmospheres. They're also getting blasted by high energy radiation from their young suns. 
which can like, you know, whittle down the sizes of these things. And so there's lots of other ways planets can change over time. And so it's hard to understand this when we don't have precise ages. And so there's, there's evidence that's been published actually in the winter meeting, there was a press conference on this topic by Travis Berger, but he was using isochronal ages, which are, which can't be applied to the low mass stars or the very youngest ages. And so we're hoping that we can, what we can bring with young cluster planets is a, a glimpse of what's happening in the earliest moments. Great. Um, this question comes from Jeff Binks, unaffiliated, and it's not directed to anyone in particular, so I'm going to put it to the group as a whole. You've talked about this a little bit, but why are there so many supersized planets? Or is it just a limitation of how small a planet we can detect with the space telescopes? Anybody who wants to step in and say a few words on that. I can take this one. Um, this is a, a really interesting question. So the reason that we are unable to find smaller, smaller planets is we have to think about how we detect transiting planets. They move in front of the star and they produce a dip in the brightness of the um, star as we're detected here on Earth or on our space telescope. And the uh, amount of dip or the depth of that dip is directly related to the radius of the planet. So if we have a really, really small planet, it's going to produce a very, very small dip, and those are really hard to detect. So the bigger the planet, bigger the dip, easier to detect. And there's a similar issue for uh, radio velocity studies too. Um, low mass planets don't jerk their stars around as much as high mass planets. Uh, similarly, high mass planets closer in make a much more dramatic change in the star's velocity. Uh, whereas if you had a small planet in the same spot, it wouldn't do that much. So I've got a follow-up question for Jason Curtis coming from Ethan Siegel of Forbes starts with a bang again. He asks for clusters like Persephone and the Pleiades, these are still somewhat tightly bound structures rather than being in the process of dissociating. Do the observations of Theia 520, Kepler 52 and Kepler 968 all together Tell us anything about the evolution of this parent cluster. Is it in the process of dissociating like the Hyades or were these just a couple of stars kicked out by, I'm speculating, some mechanism like violent relaxation? Yeah, I think that what we're seeing with Gaia is that the, the old view the, from the 1800s that clusters are these dense balls of stars is, is changing dramatically. That every, I think everywhere we look, we're finding that there are extended halos, like Luke Bauma talked about on Monday, I believe, and tidal tails, and evidence that there that these things are every every cluster is in the process of dissolving to some degree, even ones that are like you know proper clusters, like um, the older ones have very few low mass stars when we think that those should be produced most frequently. It's probably because those are, have been lost over time. Uh, I think it is interesting, actually we're just looking at this uh, this afternoon, the planet hosts in Theia 520 happen to fall in the outskirts outside the cluster core. And, you know, it seems odd that we kind of catch them right there and they're both, they're right next to each other. But it happens to be that Kepler only saw the very, very bottom portion of the cluster. And so those are the two that have the data that we can use to find the planets. But it is interesting that these two planets just happen to be kind of in the outskirts, probably on their way out the door um, as the cluster is in the process of being kind of dis dissolved. I bet I, the Praesepi has tidal tails. It's, you know, all of these are going to be kind of being dissolved. But one interesting question is, can clusters form in a more decentralized fashion? And so there are very young objects like the Pisces-Ceridana stream. It's 100 million years old and it already stretches 700 parsecs, so 2000 light years in space. There's not enough time for it to start as a dense ball and get elongated in 100 million years for it to do that. So it seems that there is these filamentary star formation and decentralized star formation happening in addition to these, these more dense uh, objects. 
hard to know without precision radial velocities, which Gaia does not provide. So that uh, maybe relates to the next question from Richard Lovett again, also for Jason. Uh, can Gaia data be used to backtrack the motions of these stars and also date the clusters by seeing how long they've been spreading out since birth? There are some attempts to do that. There's a study that will be submitted soon by Jeff Andrews studying a different Thea group, Thea 456. But the problem is we're just, we don't have the precision radial velocities. Gaia is precise in parallax and position on the sky and velocity on the sky, but not the back, the, the back and forth radial velocity. And so it, the, the, the measurement uncertainties are large enough that it, it kind of complicates the whole rewind process. And so we're in the process of proposing for telescope time on large telescopes with multi-object spectrographs where you can observe hundreds of stars simultaneously so that we can get the radial velocities that we need precise enough so that we can study these, these kinematics and dynamics and all this kind of stuff. And a last question for you from Richard Lovett. Uh, can you tell me how broad and angled this clusters of tens in the sky? So large, it sounds like. Um, I'll look it up. I don't recall. It's big. We'll, we'll add that to the Slack later. Great. That is all I have in the Q&A box right now. I have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Um, these are for John and for Saki. Um, can you tell us what the two acronyms EDI and VESPA mean? I, I think I, I figured out VESPA, I think, uh, validating extrasolar planets automatically. How did I do? Close? Um, that's pretty close, but it's a validation of exoplanet signals using a probabilistic algorithm. Okay, I would never would have gotten And that I'm completely. sorry, I should have put that on the slide. <laughs> And then uh, for John, uh, EDI, I assume the E stands for exoplanet, but I can't figure out what the D and the I are. Yeah, you are absolutely right. This is definitely a forced acronym. Uh, <laughs> it's exoplanet detector indicator, or exoplanet detection indicator. So, yeah. All right, cool. Um, and then, uh, Saki, you mentioned that uh, the validation process um, looks at things that, that appear to resemble planetary transits, mm -hmm. but might be something else. Can you just give us a real quick overview of what what, yes. what these uh, imposters might be actually? So um, if there are two stars orbiting each other, a binary star system, uh, that can sometimes produce a trans transit light event. So that will, like the star going in front of another star will block some of its light the way the planet would when it goes in front of its whole star. So that is one of the possible um, false positive scenarios that the looks at. The other is background eclipsing binary. So maybe there's, if there's a binary system that's not the host star because Kepler's um, uh, uh, pixels are so large, it didn't just observe a single star in its field of view, it looked at it's it like detect multiple objects. So uh, when we look at just the brightness and its change over time, it's not easy to figure out what exactly is dimming when you see a dip in the flux. So uh, Vespa also looks at a, whether there's a background star that is a binary star system that is being eclipsed instead of the target star that you're looking at and uh, compares that to the transit signal from a planet. Okay, and then finally, also for both of you, um, what percentage of planet candidates end up being confirmed or validated? Is it a, a very significantly high percentage or is it actually a low percentage? And I guess I'm referring specifically to the Kepler and K2 databases. So K2 is still in Prado. I think I've gone through about, um, a hundred uh, or so so far out of 758 uh, that we're looking at. And uh, we have confidently validated 21 of those. Uh, like I mentioned, we use constraints sometimes. So if the probability is close to being 99%, uh, but the false positive probability being close to 90, uh, less than 1%. So the probability of 
it being a planet being very high, uh, we can try to use something else uh, that uh, is a tool that Christy, uh, no, the Jack Lasauer uh, described in this paper, where uh, multiple transit signals or uh, multiple events around the same star are very likely to be real planets. So uh, if you have those, uh, you can definitely like uh, try and uh, increase the probability of your signal being a planet and then get it close to the threshold that we need for it to be uh, validated. Um, that's one method. And then John, maybe you can talk yeah. about um, So for confirming planets, one of the real limiting factors is the magnitude or the brightness of these stars. So for the Kepler field, we're really good at confirming the planets that have, are really bright, you know, have a magnitude uh, up to about 11 or 12th magnitude and the Kepler band. But beyond that, it gets really, really difficult to get good RV signatures that we can get precise RVs from. Um, with that said, there's a lot of instruments coming online in the near future that are going to greatly improve our ability to probe into this um, more dim parameter space and be able to confirm a larger fraction of these, both Kepler and K2 planets. So it's definitely exciting to see in the near future. Thank you. I know we're at time, Rick, but I've got one more question that came in from Ethan Siegel again from Stars with a Bang. This is also for Jason. Uh, how close are the metallicities of the parent stars for Kepler 52, Kepler 968, and Theia 520? Are they extremely similar? Do they follow a position-based distribution or are they widely disparate? So we have metallicity measurements for the two planet hosts. They're consistent with the solar metallicity. Uh, there, there are uncertainties and doing spectroscopy for K dwarfs is tough. They're not like the best for doing this. Uh, we have some metallicity measurements for a handful of other stars from Apogee and Lamost. They're also consistent with solar. So what we can say in kind of broad terms is that the cluster seems to have a solar metallicity, but with like seven different stars, we can't really do any like, you know, fine tune like investigation of metallicity spreads or anything like that. So that'll require follow-up spectroscopy. Okay, then I think we'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much, Susanna, for going through all those questions. And thanks to everybody who submitted questions. Had a lot of really good ones there. So first off, I'd of course like to thank our presenters today. Uh, really appreciate your taking the time to, to share your exciting results with us. I'd like to thank everybody who tuned in both here in Zoom and also on the YouTube live stream. Uh, we appreciate your attendance. I'd like to thank the uh, public information officers who helped uh, prep the presenters for their briefings and also who prepared press releases. And I'd like to thank also our sponsor of the press office here, uh, University Space Research, Research Association, USRA. Um, they've been very generous in uh, at in-person meetings, uh, sponsoring refreshments for the press corps. Uh, and for the virtual meetings, they've helped us offset the cost of, of the streaming and uh, all the software that we need to put these, these uh, briefings on. Uh, so with that, um, I'd like to announce the date and time of the next briefing. Susanna, maybe you could share your screen one more time. Uh, our hope, of course, is that the next AAS meeting in January will be uh, an in-person meeting. And if it is, then the next press conference will be on Monday, uh, January 10th, 2022. And the person hosting that briefing will be uh, my colleague, Susanna Kohler, who you've met today. Uh, she'll be taking over from me as AAS press officer as I uh, not fade away, but uh, go off into retirement uh, to do whatever the heck I feel like doing and to say no to the things that I don't feel like doing. Um, and with that, I will sign off for my final press conference as AAS press officer. And thank you.